I think Islam hates us. They have done nothing except wreak havoc and terror for our faith and our religion. We, when we stand up to those who oppress our communities, that Allah accepts from us that as a form of jihad. Foundations of society are fragile. We must be the shepherds of our own civilization. If anyone answers either yes or no without making necessary distinctions, both are not telling the truth. They're lying. Father, we pray that your word will become a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces. That you will raise up in this nation pulpits and prophets that will call the nation back to repentance. Will you distance yourself from those who think differently or will you join us at the table and talk about what is really important? This is the Maida Initiative, conversation without compromise. So this is the 51st episode. 51st episode, season two, episode one. Wow. So how, how, how do you feel about it? I mean, you're continuing it, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. The, mm-hmm. the pivot, though, is that we're being a little more concise. Because w- one of my favorite things about, mm-hmm. you know, hanging out with the Muslim world and the Middle East in general, yeah. these long, rambling conversations about nothing and everything. That's it. Which would basically describe mo- the majority of my first 50 episodes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Well, and, and so there's some good stuff in there, but you really have to like search for it. Yeah. So if I was talking, if so, if I met a Muslim who wants to learn something about Christianity, or a Christian mm-hmm. who wants to learn about something about Islam, I don't. Yeah. It'd be like, okay, watch this episode, and then like an hour and twelve minutes into it, you can. There's a really concise <laughs> definition of this, right? Yeah. So, so the idea is to be a little bit more disciplined, mm-hmm. to make it a little more accessible, yeah, and to kind of be the and the next ten episodes, I'm trying to get people who are. Uh, leaders of various Muslim communities who mm-hmm. know what they're talking about yeah. to kind of go over some sort of basic level issues. Mm-hmm. Then season, th- so ten episodes of that will be season two. Season okay. three will be will be uh, more kind of political. I see. And then season four will be like more kind of cultural. Mm-hmm. But you can't re. But I because I I really believe that all politics at some point goes back to religion. For sure. And yeah. Then all culture goes back to religion as well. Yeah. But it, it's very difficult to talk about those things in that way yeah. unless you have a proper baseline yeah. for them, right? Uh-huh. So that's what we're going to do with these. Perfect. 10 so, episodes. so why are these shorter than the first one? So the reason these are shorter is because we could ha- we could have a six hour conversation about Jesus and Muhammad. Right we, now. Yeah. And for for some people who are into this sort of stuff, they'll they enjoy. Love, it, yeah. But the rest of the mm. but you have a lot of people out there who are like. Okay, I want to just I want to take a bite of this. Yes, but yeah. This just seems so. We have an after show, so yeah. we we can go as long as we want to today. Yeah. But we're just gonna have some specific Thank, yeah, great yeah. points. Okay, well, that's good. That's good. I'm excited to actually hear about Jesus. I haven't um, heard the Christian version in maybe since high school now. Okay. Yeah, so I'm excited. Well, I I will do my best. Yeah. So, the first two episodes we're doing together, right? Okay. So, uh, first episode here, you're mm-hmm. going to explain to me... Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And yep. then... Oh, okay, so we're doing two episodes today. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. see. Okay, I got it. Unless you have to go see your wife or something. No, no. Maybe? I make sure I'm, you know... Monday, these are usually the good times, you know. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so we'll take 45 minutes on Muhammad, mm-hmm. um, 45 minutes on Jesus, then mm-hmm. after that, whatever we want to talk about. That, that's it. All right. I think I'm ready. So, tell me... So... Very quickly, kind of introduce mm-hmm. who you are, yeah. like how you became an imam, mm-hmm. and and then then tell me the story of uh, who Muhammad is, and then okay, uh, right now starting. Or has it been recording this we, whole time? It, it, well, so we'll, so you when it, when I leaned over there and yeah, that time, oh, it's just that's, that. That's that's, that's like, I've been recording the whole time, mm-hmm. but I'll publish everything after the time is turned on. Okay, so even these three minutes, we were getting the thing. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, was... but, it, but it's, there's an important reason to that. Yeah, is because a big part of the necessary of the conversation, as well as talking about the ideas, mm-hmm. we've got to interact with the people. Yeah, right. So somebody walks, somebody, the average Seattleite may see you walking down the street, and and just sort of see you as austere religious scholar, yeah. right? Yeah, they wouldn't know you could talk to you about sci-fi. <laughs> and that's that's really important to me to be able to have the fun parts of the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa ala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Fuad Muhammad. Um, I've lived in Seattle the majority of my life. 
I've been an imam since uh, 2016. Yeah, since 2000, yes, to the early 2016, I've been an imam um, in different, uh, you know, mosques here in Seattle, Washington. Um, I started uh, seeking knowledge uh, to become an imam uh, when I was in 11th grade uh, in high school. Uh, after graduating high school, uh, I moved to Egypt, um, studied there, came back, and I've been an imam. I've been um, continuing, uh, you know, to learn and just, yeah, been an imam. In Egypt, so was that Al Azhar or? Yeah. Okay. Good, because that's the one that I know. Yeah, and then, you know, other, other programs that were uh, available there. But um, so today, uh, you invited me to speak about uh, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam Muhammad uh, from the from basically his whole life. Okay, so let me stop you there real quick. Uh, yeah. So you you say a few words after you say Muhammad's name, you say a few words in Arabic mm -hmm. for the non uh, okay. for the non-Muslim <laughs> listeners. Explain yeah. what you're doing there, what that means. Um, so after we mention uh, the name of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we add uh, you know uh, in English the rough translation would be. Uh, may Allah have, may, may peace be upon him. This is the you know the common uh, translation that you see. But what we are actually saying is that God has you know given him peace, right? And also the angels have given him peace, and then us we're also uh, giving him peace. And the reason why we do this, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he commanded us to do it. That whenever we see we hear the name of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, we add the uh, peace be upon him afterwards. And it becomes, you know, after a little bit, it, it, it becomes like you can't even say his name without saying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right. So that, you know, that's what it means. And it, it just, you know, rolls out of the tongue and um, we get rewarded uh, for every time we say it. And every single time we do say it, uh, we get the same greeting back. You know, so there's the added benefit of uh, the, the, the prayer going back to you. And ultimately, uh, you know, we're looking for peace in this world. So that's what's uh, getting back to us. Is that clear? Yes, it okay, is. Okay, perfect. Um, now, um, I don't think we can talk about Jesus or Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in 45 minutes. Even sure. even in you know six, whatever time we give ourselves, we won't be able to give them the rights that they have. But just you know to get a basic understanding, uh, the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it is generally broken down into three stages. Uh, you have the stage from when he was born up until he was 40. And this is what they call the time before prophethood. So this is, you know, his normal life uh, before the big responsibilities are placed upon them. And then from the year, uh, from the time that he was 40 until 63, this is generally the, uh, the stage uh, that is mo we mostly focus on. Now this stage is broken down into two parts. You have 13 years, so from the time that he was 40 up until he was 53, that he was in Mecca, uh, in modern day Saudi or Saudi Arabia. And for 13 years he was there, um, calling the people to the sovereignty of God, uh, calling them to worship um, you know, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah is uh, the name that you know, we use for God. Then you have from the time that he was 53 for the next 10 years where he was living in Medina. And this is where the Islamic empire comes from. While, in the, while they were in Mecca, you know, they were the, the minority. You have less than 200 Muslims that embrace, you know, that become Muslims uh, between the time of uh, him being 40 all the way until 53. And then maybe 80 of them, they go and migrate. Uh, sometime you know uh, when the persecution gets too heavy and then in Medina this is where Islam completely flourishes and the empire you know starts from there and it goes on um, this is you know just the the basics now you know it would benefit us to talk about important things in all of these three stages and I would choose things that you know I think are important like I view as what can I hear about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that shocks me from these, you know, three stages? Because these are, you know, 63 years, right? And that's a lot of things, you know, that are happening. In the time that um, he was 
he wasn't a prophet. He was just a you know person from the tribe of Quraysh. And they were the leaders. Um, they had basically the key to the Kaaba. They had the, um, uh, the the place that you know from during that time, from all over the world, people would come annually to go and perform the pilgrimage. And when they would perform the pilgrimage, they would have the trade. Uh, you know, people would come to sell, people would come to buy, and so on. So the family of or the tribe of Quraysh, they were the ones that were in charge of this, and they were the guardians of Mecca. So they had a very high status. And during these forty years. Among these people, um, he was known as, you know, Sadiq al Amin, the, the most truthful and trustworthy, just because of, you know, the characteristics that he had. He was a man that, you know, he did not worship the idols that, you know, the people were worshiping him. And there was him and uh, maybe four or five uh, others in the community that, you know, were not uh, following the, um, the practices of, of their people and just how righteous they were. You know, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he wasn't known to be a liar any time in his life, right? So especially this time, they trusted him uh, to the point um, there's, there was uh, the Kaaba. It, it has gone through changes ever since Abraham built it or Ibrahim Alaihi Wasallam has built it. It has gone through some, some changes. So when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was about 25 years old, it, there was a, a fire that destroyed it. It destroyed portions of it, and they, you know they had to build it back up. So they got together, uh, the tribes of uh, Quraysh, and they decided uh, let's collect all of the wealth that we have that have you know th- that did not come from uh, vile things. So they left the the wealth that came from gambling. They left the wealth that came from you know brothel houses. Uh, they left like anything that they saw as. You know, it was not permissible to them, even though they engaged in it. So they finally decided, okay, uh, let's build it back. After building it back, the issue came of who is going to place back the black stone. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, people don't know what the black stone is. This is um, a stone that came down from heaven when Ibrahim uh, and his son Ismail, alayhim salam, they were building the, uh, the Kaaba. And it came down from heaven. It was white, and it was placed in, in uh, inside of the Kaaba. Uh, you can see it on the outside. There's like a silver circular thing, you know, mold that is holding it. And the touch of the people and the sin, you know, a person that touches it, uh, all of their sins are going to be forgiven. So because of the touching that, you know, the amount uh, that has been done from the time Abraham put it, all the way to our time, it turned black. So this was something, you know, that they viewed as, even though they were, you know, pagans uh, and they were worshipping idols, they knew that uh, this was a special rock. So now they decided, uh, every tribe said, we are going to put it. So you have, you know, these tribes uh, ready to fight one another over who gets to uh, place the thing. Then they said, if we kill each other here, our tribes are going to be at war for all of time. So they decided, you know, whoever walks in uh, through the gates of, uh, the of of the sanctuary will be the one that will place it. Will, will place it. It doesn't matter what tribe he is. When they came to this com- conclusion that whoever comes in will place it, the one that comes in is Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And all of them, they said, the truthful one has come, the most trustworthy one has come, and we are pleased with him placing the rock. So, and this is from all of the tribes, not just his tribe, but you know all of the other tribes that are living uh, around Mecca. So they decide he is going to place it because of how much they trusted him and you know how, how truthful he was. So he eventually decides, you know, uh, put it on a sheet, have each tribe, you know, grab a portion of it and then take it to the place it's supposed to go. And then he would take it and, uh, you know, with his hands and he would put it in. So this is the main thing that um, I would point to that happened before prophethood. The other one, when he married Khadija, uh, our mother, radiallahu uh, anha, she gifted him a servant uh, by the name of Zaid ibn al-Harith. When she gifted to him, uh, he's a uh, servant that you know was captured in Yemen and he's brought to Mecca. And Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he you know takes care of him. Uh, then some years later, his family finally comes from Yemen and they find him, and they tell him, uh, they go to Muhammad and they say, you know, let us take Zaid home. So Muhammad, he, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, go ahead and take Zayd. You can take him. 
uh, you know, I'll, I'll free him and you can go and take him. So his uncles, uh, they go to Zaid and they tell him, we, you know, it's time for you to come uh, home with us now. Your time of being a servant is over. Let's go home. And he refuses to go. So he tells him, you know, I, I, I spent 10 years with him and I have never seen a man like him. Right. From how he is, from the way that he interacts with him. I have never seen a man like him. So now I'm, I'm going to stay with him. And the Prophet Sallallahu he tries to convince him to go, but he refuses and he says, I'm going to stay. Then the Prophet Sallallahu he frees him and he says, you know, this is my son. He's going to inherit from me. Uh, so he becomes the adopted son of the Prophet Sallallahu So this, these are things that happen in, uh, before prophethood comes. The other thing, uh, the thing I would point out in the time uh, that he was in Mecca for 13 years was the Quraysh. They did not really like, you know, what he was preaching to. And it wasn't because they did not believe in Allah, right? The disbelief that they had was that they needed the idols in order for the people to keep coming. And when the people keep on coming, if we take all of these idols away, that means our trade is gone. People are not going to continuously come here and so on. So they did not, you know, approve his message. And they tried, they made it very hard, very difficult for him. And one of the things that they were known for, uh, the Arabs were known for, was, was their poetry. So they invited uh, one of their major poets uh, by the name of Hassan ibn Thabit, who was from Medina or Yathrib at that time, and uh, he was in Mecca. So they tell him, go and look at Muhammad and then make poetry mocking him so that we can go and show the people uh, this is our poet and this is what he's saying about Muhammad. So he decides... Okay, this is what I'm going to do. They, you know, they they give him money and they they send him. So he finds, you know, he's he's waiting to see Muhammad. And while he's waiting, he finally sees him coming. And when he sees him coming, you know, he tells the story later on. He starts looking at him, and the like the the nur or the light that comes from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam puts so much fear in him that he covers his eyes with his hands. So he takes his hand and he covers it. And he looks at him again and he tells himself that this is not a normal human being. This is a person that, you know, he, he says, you know, the soul that he has, it is a soul from light that is inside of a body taken from the moon. So he goes to uh, back to the Quraysh that hired him. And he says, uh, they ask him, where is the poetry? He says, I'm not going to talk about Muhammad. And they say, this is not why we paid you. This is not why we brought you here to do this thing. And then he describes to them, you know, he says, I want Allah to bear witness that I know Muhammad is his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now they get furious. And he describes him just by seeing him and he tells him, you know, when I saw him, the nood came, the, the light was so much that I had to cover my face because of fear that I was going to uh, go blind by looking at him. And this is not, you know, the face of someone that you guys are accusing him of the things uh, that he's doing. So he becomes a Muslim, uh, and then you know he lives sixty years of uh, of being a Muslim. He goes with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and he becomes someone that you know. After the death of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he travels as far as China, you know, spreading Islam. Um, then you have uh, the offer that is given to him, on, you know, he should give up this call. He should stop calling, to, uh, you know, the the idols to be left alone. And one of the things they offer him, they tell him, we'll give you if, you, if it's a woman that you're seeking, you know, through this message of yours, through this calling of yours, we'll give you the best woman that we have. We'll make you the richest person. We'll make you the leader of this place. And he rejects all of that. While he knows he's struggling, he's poor, he's really going, not, not only him, but also his companions. So this is, you know, uh, things that were happening in, in that stage of his life. The other thing is in the last stage in Medina, um, the thing that you know really sticks out uh, to me is uh, Anas uh, عنه, When the Prophet ﷺ made hijrah, so when he migrated from Mecca to Medina or to Yathrib at the time and then uh, it was changed to Medina, the mother of Anas, she comes to the Prophet ﷺ and she's very poor. And she tells him, I can't give you anything. Everyone's given the Prophet ﷺ gifts, and I can't give you anything, but I will give you this boy and let him, uh, you know, let him serve you. 
So he becomes the servant of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And after the death of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, the, the, the people that come after, they ask him how he was and so on. He says, describing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I was with him for 10 years. And not once did I do something. And he told me, why did I do that thing? And not once did I not do something. And he never questioned, you know, by saying, why did you do this or why did you not do this? Whatever I came to him with, he was pleased with. Right? And, it, and when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he's 20 years old. So he remembers all of these things that you know, he goes through. Uh, and then the other one, um, there was a Jew, a rabbi. Uh, in Medina, there was uh, a very big you know, Jewish community. So one of the rabbis, he goes to meet the Prophet wasallam, but of course he wants to hide himself. And his name is Abdullah ibn Salam radiallahu anhu. So he sees him, you know, like the first day he comes into Medina. When he sees him, he knows right away, he says, this is not the face of a liar. So whatever he comes with, you know, he's not coming to us with lies. So when he sees him, the first thing that he hears from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it really shows you the essence of, you know, what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was calling to. And he says, you know, the first thing that he hears, him, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, O mankind, spread the peace, you know, sp spread the greeting, uh, feed those that need to be fed, pray during the night while the people are asleep so that you can enter the, the, the paradise of your Lord in peace. So as soon as he hears this, he becomes a Muslim. And of course, there are other things, you know, that we can talk about with these two, you know, the, the first moments that, you know, people meet him and, and those that really spent a lot of time with him the way they, they, you know, they describe him. I think this should be enough for now on you know, how he is. Yeah. What do you think? Great. So this, this, is a, this is a good intro. Um, so that's kind of a kind of intro to his, his kind of character and his, his personality. Mm -hmm. for, the, for the Muslim living today, mm -hmm. what, is the, what is the significance of all that for how they live their lives? What, what's the significance for you? For me personally, and I would say for Muslims, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he describes them and he says, for you there's a perfect example in the messenger for those that desire God and those that desire the hereafter. And this is what we as Muslims are trying to achieve. We are trying to achieve the pleasure of you know, our Lord, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the good that is going to come on the day of judgment. So for us, the significance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that he is the key to that. He is the key to those that desire Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He came to us as a guide. Right? He came, he, what, what, any good that there was, he guided us to it. And any evil that you know, was, is, is out there, he told us how to stay away from it. And he guided us away from it. And like, so there's you know, that role of him being our leader, um, him being our guide and on top of that he is the most beloved to every single Muslim right one of the um, the beliefs that we have is that for you, for us to truly be believers we have to love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam more than we love ourselves more than we love anything in this world and this is true for all of the Muslims you are not going to find Muslims that you know will doubt the love of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as being a integral part of our religion, right? One day Umar ibn al-Khattab radiyallahu anhu, who is you know a companion of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the great, the second greatest man after the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he goes to him and he tells him, "I love you more than anything in this dunya, except for myself, for my mother, and for my father." And dunya means like dunya, uh, the world we're living in present yeah, kind of Yes, thing. yes. Forgive me. Thank you for pointing it out. That's why you know, we're here. That's why we're here. You know, I convinced myself on my way here. I'm not going to use any of you know the words that I'm gonna just speak in English. Well, but, it's fine because when, yeah. when those come up, right, people yeah. will hear those. Yeah. So it's good to explain them. Perfect. So he tells him this: "I love you more than the world. More than I, I love you more than everything except for three things: myself, my parents, right, my mom and my dad." Then the Prophet ﷺ, he tells him, you have not attained complete faith. So he goes back and he comes back. And then he tells him, I love you more than everything in this dunya, except for myself. So he is saying, you know, I love myself more than I love you now. Then he tells him, you have not attained complete faith. He sends him away. He comes back. And this third time he says, 
I love you more than anything in this world, including myself. And then the Prophet ﷺ tells him, now you have complete faith. And this is something that all Muslims have. And, you know, like, he, you know, when you read about his life, the things that he cared for, not only for those that were with him, but those that come after. Um, in one of the addresses that he gives to the uh, the helpers from Medina, he tells them, when I, when I pass away, you are going to come, you know, a time is going to come on you when there's a lot of differences. What I want you to do when that time comes, it is to have patience until you meet me at the pond. And the pond, this is a, uh, the pond that we're hopefully uh, going to drink from before we enter heaven. And then also um, about a couple of weeks before his death, uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he decides to go and visit the uh, graves uh, the t like the two major grave sites and the two major you know the, the people that died at the battle of Badr there was a grave site for them and the people that died at the uh, battle of Uhud so the Prophet ﷺ, he goes and he gets a companion uh, and he tells him come with me and you know he goes with him and he gives you know the greetings to uh, the people that are in the grave and he says uh, you have preceded us and we are going to come after you right this is this is where we're all heading you, the ones that are in the grave, they're ahead of us. And those that are alive eventually are going to join them. And then uh, by this time, there's you know, other, other companions around him. And he says, uh, I miss my brothers. And when he says, I miss my brothers, the companions, they ask, you know, are, are we not your brothers? You know, to them, this is, uh, we're your brothers. We are those that are with you. And he says, no, you are my companions. My brothers are those that are going to come after me that have not seen me, but they have believed in me. I miss them. When we hear this hadith, or this statement of the Prophet wasallam, he's talking about us. Right? He's talking about those I've never seen, the Prophet wasallam, But I love him more than anything in this world. And thinking back that he was missing us, how can he not be significant to us? When without even knowing us, he was missing us. And he would spend his days, you know, uh, praying to God for us. And on the day of judgment, he's going to continue to pray for us. When everybody is worried about, you know, th their selves, he's going to be worried about his nation. And we are from amongst his nation. So this is, you know, the significance uh, that the Prophet ﷺ has in our lives. And this is, I don't want to take, you know, too much time talking about this. But it's not something that we can put into words, you know. Um, like when the Prophet ﷺ, you know, was getting close to death, he gives up and he gives a ceremony to the mosque, and he says in there, a slave has been given a choice, to either live in this world forever, or to go and meet his creator. So after that, he says, and the slave has chosen to go and meet his creator. Right when that happens, Abu Bakr, his closest companion. He gets up and he says, we will sacrifice our mothers and our fathers for you. Do not accept that you are going to leave us. You know, do not leave us, stay here. If he was willing to sacrifice, you know, his mother and his father, every single Muslim that comes after, they would do it without a doubt. And this is really, you know, the significance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to us. So, um, to, to kind of get some um, maybe difficult questions here. Right. Uh. So you have, on the one hand, what you're saying, mm -hmm. right? A man of exemplary character who just kind of has this profound effect on everybody he meets. Yeah. On the other hand, some people will go into his life mm -hmm. and they will, and they'll get inspiration for things that we'd all think are kind of appalling. Mm -hmm. And then you'd also have some people from the West go and look at his life and find things they think are appalling. Mm -hmm. And you'd also find people from the West who go and find things they admire, right? Mm -hmm. So people go and draw inspiration from Muhammad's life and existence for mm -hmm. a whole range of things. Yeah. How do you how would you advise somebody to kind of cut through how to figure out what's true, what isn't, how to how to know you're getting the real deal? So uh, this is a very wonderful question. In order for you to truly understand the Prophet 
you can't learn just so, like bits of his life. You have to act, like look at the whole picture. You have to learn about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam from any source you want, right? Even if it's a source from the West, if you go to it, you know there's going to be some things that are missing. So fill in those things. And for the people that, you know, like let's say they draw the wrong conclusions, most of the time, and if not 100% of the time, it is when you look at certain aspects of the Prophet ﷺ's life without looking at it as a whole. So when you don't get the full picture, but you get, you know, just a little bit of it, and you're like, okay, this is what I got from it, this is how he is. And this is what you generally see, is whoever is given the story, they have what they want to show, right? So they'll omit things or they'll add things. And unless you completely learn the life of the Prophet ﷺ, you're not going to be able to, uh, you know, fully know uh, all of the aspects of him. And once you learn all of the aspects of the Prophet ﷺ, then you see these things that those that were closest to him were saying. Is that clear? Yeah. Digging into that a little more, right? Mm -hmm. So when Sahih al-Bukhari is codified, there's what, 600,000 hadith yeah. out there at that point? Yeah. So to get a complete picture of Muhammad is mm -hmm. a great deal of work mm -hmm. for the average Muslim, right? Yeah. So you, you've kind of chosen the path of knowledge and have become an imam. Yeah. So you've clearly kind of done a deep dive into hadith. Mm -hmm. but that's difficult for the average person. Mm -hmm. so, and so let me try and frame this as a question. Because okay. One thing I've noticed yeah. in in the Mus in the Muslim community, not all the time, yeah. but some but uh, but some of the time, is that it's very easy because of the nature of the hadith mm -hmm. and the Quran for somebody to kind of go back into the materials and do what you're saying, read what they want, mm -hmm. and sometimes it may be the sort of more yeah. hardline stuff. But other, mm -hmm. other time, you know, okay, uh, Muhammad would have been a, a gay rights advocate and waved yeah. the rainbow flag, yeah. and, and, right? Uh, yeah. So, so how do you, how does a person know? Because it's hard to, to figure out if you're not just finding what you want to find in there. How does mm -hmm. a person know if they're not doing that? How can you be sure you're actually trying to be objective? So, um, I want to spend a little bit of time on uh, just the hadith and you know what they are. A lot of Muslims, and also non-Muslims, they have this you know flawed notion of Sahih al-Bukhari was the first hadith book that was written. And whatever he has, whatever is outside of it, there's no other hadith. But the fact is, Sahih al-Bukhari was completed almost 200 years after the life of the Prophet ﷺ. But it was not the first hadith book. You have books that came before that are much larger. You have books that have over uh, 120,000 narrations that come way before the time of Imam Bukhari. You know, you're talking like a hundred years at least. And this puts it closer to uh, the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, how can, you know, you find the way that, basically, how can you find the complete picture? The best way to find the complete picture is usually uh, when someone tells a story, uh, especially in the West, they tell the story of the Prophet ﷺ from like one aspect of his life, and this is what they show you. So, for example, you have, um, based on you know who you're speaking to, you'll have some people that will show the life of the Prophet ﷺ as a military general. But the time that you know he was a military general or a commander or a, or a leader, it's only maybe 11 years or 10 years out of 63 years. Then you have uh, people that will look into just his, you know, uh, like his his the way that you know he was but they don't know how to really find the truthful ones from the lies that are made against the prophet ﷺ, right and this has been made clear by scholars like imam bukhari the thing that we the reason we hold them in you know such high regard imam bukhari was he came and he decided what i'm going to do is find the most authentic statements from the prophet ﷺ, not all of them, but find the most authentic ones and gather them in one book. He did that. And in the book, like you said, there's, I think, about 9,000 hadith or statements, actions, and uh, the approval of the Prophet ﷺ without repetition. Without repetition, there's about uh, 2,400. But 
this is not all of the things because Imam Bukhari himself he memorized over a million hadith, right? So you, in order to really know the complete you know life of the Prophet you'd have to read it from those that knew him the best. So you find the earliest uh, books that were written on his life, and the earliest one I believe was written uh, maybe a hundred and like a hundred and twenty years after the life of the Prophet So that would be. Um Ibn Ishaq, but we, we but we don't have a copy mm-hmm. from Ibn Ishaq himself. Yeah. What we have is Ibn Hisham's mm-hmm. right, which yeah. is, is a and this is Bukhari. Yeah, a little bit and this is usually how it is for uh more like the hadith books. You have the the teacher narrating to the students and then the students would write it down. And they would say this is the uh what our teacher, for example, Imam Bukhari gave us. So you can look at the seerah of Ibn Hisham, which is just the seerah of Ibn Ishaq, which is really, in reality, the seerah of the companion of the Prophet because he's telling you this is what they said, right? And you can look at that book and say, okay, what do the Muslim scholars say about this? Because books are not like, we don't just take it from the author and say we accept it, no matter how righteous that person might have been. We'll take it and we'll try to verify it. So they've tried to verify it to know which one, like, they'll look in the chain, you know, of the narrations that come, and they will know this person's a liar, this person never met this person, so this is another lie, so we have to take these out. And that has been done, and it continues to be done. You know, every time the, the books are being revised, things that, when you look at the, you know, the, the history of, of the people, like, you can open a book, and learn about every single thing about anyone that has ever made a statement about the Prophet Sallallahu So you know this person said this on this time, these were the people around, and what was, you know, what type of person was he? So through that it gets, you know, verified all the way until you have a book that is given to you that doesn't have all of these things in it. Right? All of these verifications, all of these, you know, years of work that it takes for it to come to this spot. So when you're given that one, and you you know you like today, um, if you read uh, like the seerah of Ibn Kathir, this came much later after the life of the Prophet right, right. but it will tell you majority of what you know the life of the Prophet was, without you know the the removing all of like trying his best to make it as authentic as possible. But you also have people that come after him and point out some of the inaccuracies that are in there. So this is always there, and how do they know? They just go back to the books that were already written, and try to you know put it together. So, so when you say when you say books are already written, right? Are you are you referring to an actual text somewhere, or are we talking about the the books that that Bukhari and Muslim and Imam Muslim are kind of revising? So they they weren't like revising. Um, let me give it. So uh, Imam. The, the, there's a book, the first like official hadith book written, official official one where we still have copies, you know, of today, is you have the Muwatta of Imam Malik. Uh, Imam Malik, he is about, I would say, 60, 70 years uh, before Imam Bukhari. Okay. And this is, he is in the hun- about 140 ish years after the Prophet. <laughs> When he gathers his book, uh, like as soon as the Prophet ﷺ passed away, there was not much need uh, f- to you know write down the books, write down the hadith. But there were still uh, books that were written. You have some of the companions that you know wrote you know hadith books. You have Abu Huraira who wrote some of his you know uh, like he would send a hadith that he heard from the Prophet ﷺ to other you know other students, and he would actually write it down. Fun fact for our listeners: uh, Abu Huraira means father of the kitten. Allah, there you go. Okay, yes, um, that is his uh, nick or that is his, his nickname. The way that you know they used to call them. So he wrote like he would. He narrated the most hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, over five thousand, and he would you know he would write it down and he would you know send it to people. And those writings today we can find you know the manuscripts that have survived. Then after um, during like the time of Imam Bukhari. Uh, he wrote a book, uh, one of the earliest books on the history of men, and it's called Tarikh al Kabir al Bukhari. You know the the big history uh, of Imam Bukhari. So in this book, uh, it has forty thousand narrators, 
What this means is it has the life of 40,000 plus people that have ever made a statement about the Prophet Sallallahu Even if they've only said one hadith, like one statement that they've taken to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they're in that book and their whole life is there. Whether they were righteous people, whether they were evil people, what were they known for, all of this. And then you have others you know, that, that come, even during the time of Imam Bukhari, and before him that write books that are similar, that talk about the lives of these people. So when they come, uh, you have you know, other hadith books that come after. All you would do is you would look at the names that you know, these scholars have classified as being liars, as being you know, people, uh, maybe they like, they would get it to the point where they'll tell you what his issue is. Uh, they'll tell you this is how many times he has forgotten this hadith. This is how many times he narrated it wrong, even though it's in this book like this. Right, so you have this and all you do when you open it is you go back to those and say, this hadith or this statement or this claim that is being made is being made by these people. Who are these people? Are these righteous people that we can accept it from them? And if they're not, even if one of them has an issue, we will leave that alone and we will not you know, take it and say this is the statement of the Prophet wasallam. And then therefore, this is not the life of the Prophet wasallam. But like that, you are able to get the complete picture uh, of the Prophet wasallam. So it seems like, um, to kind of break it down a little bit here, mm. that it's not so much that you go to a specific text somewhere to kind of get an yeah. overview of Muhammad, is that you have this kind of general, it's, it kind of comes from a relationship of learning from the scholarly community. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's not one book that is there. It's hundreds of books. And that have been passed down through, um, you know, paper nowadays. Uh, before it was much more orally, and you have people that have you know crazy memories that, are, that that they were able to memorize these things, and then you move on, uh, and you have uh, you know the printing and the today, you can go to most libraries, uh, most big libraries, and you can find manuscripts of books that have not been printed. Here at the uh, University of Washington, they have amazing manuscripts, amazing ones. You go to the Library of Congress, amazing manuscript, Cambridge, Oxford, uh, some, you know, uh, the, I think the Grand, Grand Library of, of Berlin. They have manuscripts that we, that are not printed yet, right? But you, there's people that are able to read it and say, okay, this is what they said. This is, you know, and then you even have corrections that are made to books that are written today when they find manuscripts and they notice the, you know, the uh, inaccuracies that are found in it. Like that, right, 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 right. Yeah. Well, thanks. That's a that's a that's a that's kind of really helpful breakdown. Yeah. And I think that's, and so I think the the, it seems to me the main argument against the extremists all the time, mm-hmm. but also the nuance in the West is that people view this too simplistically, <laughs> right? Yeah. That that there's um. The, the kind of the Muslim answer to extremism is one of patience is needed, uh, nuance is needed, mm-hmm. um, and it's kind of difficult to to kind of get people to look at that sometime, right? Yeah. When, when you have a world with chaotic things going on and you know wars and oppression and all these things, to be able to be like, okay, you got to read for a lot longer. Yeah, this is not necessarily an answer so many people want to hear. Yeah, all that often. Yeah, that's that's you know that's the biggest issue. It's um. And it's not just like unique to Islam. You find it in all religions that you, and even like the people that are on the outside, they don't want to spend the time that is required for them to learn about a specific subject. So what is one thing that I can take that will interest me and will interest the people around me? It is usually the things that are like things that are outside of the norm. Right? If we were to sit here and you tell someone, come, we're going to spend one year learning about the life of the Prophet ﷺ, nobody's going to come. Whether you're, you're inviting Muslims or you're inviting uh, you know, non-Muslims. But if you, someone, you know, made a thing talking about, let's say, the like, terrorism in Islam, mm-hmm. and how you, that's going to be packed. And this is what we see. Right. right? right. So you see like, you know, the fear-mongering that comes. Like, these, this is what they have in their religion. I'm going to go learn about it. Right. So you go there, and this is all you're going to be given. Right. Right? And that takes very quick. 
you know, you don't need to spend a lot of time on it. We can call it the clickbait vacation. There you well. go. Right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you for thank you for sharing what you shared. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Yeah, no worries. Thank uh, you for having me. And thank you guys for listening to the Almeida Initiative podcast. We will be back next week. Thank you.